I think I just wanted to be loved unconditionally. If you're able to get a mentor. Mm -hmm. So investing in myself by way of being a lifelong learner. Being high value is a lot of unnecessary things every day. Staying in education and keeping my mind right yeah. is how I've overstepped poverty. Not everyone's on your side. Not everyone's fighting your battles. You have to fight those battles. Overstepping poverty. 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 Hello? I'm overstepping poverty right now. Welcome back to Overstepping Poverty, the podcast that provides you with tips, tricks, and hacks in Overstepping Poverty. My name is Daquan Brooks, and I'm here with my co-host, Zakia Shaw. How you doing, Zakias? I'm doing good today, brother. You know, it's the first episode of season two. Let's go. I'm excited to get back in the studio. You know, we have another awesome special guest with us today. How have you been? I've been good. I've been good. Golf game's been terrible. Okay. Uh, my wife and I, we went out <laughs> the last couple of days, and I usually give her strokes on every nine holes that we play, and uh, she's beaten me both times. <laughs> what? Um, yeah. Yep. So I wasn't going to mention it, but I was like, you know what? This is a this is a learning curve for me right now. I might as well just get it out there in, in the open, and I'll, I'm going to go practice while she's not here and she's working. Right. It's my day off. So okay. um, I'm going to go practice, make sure that I can beat her the next time. So, yeah, well, I'm not surprised that she's whooping you in. The I'm glad you she's, have faith in me. Uh, in her. In <laughs> yeah. <Lee YouTube>. Um, <laughs> but yeah, as everybody knows, we have a website that we've launched now where you're able to go to www.oversteppingpoverty.com to support and get some merch. I'm wanting to get into this interview today, man. What do you I think? am as well. I All am right. ready. Let's go. Why don't you go ahead and lead us into that? Yeah, so today we have a very special guest, like I mentioned. He is the mayor of our great city here in Sioux Falls. He's actually the third person that went to Dort to be on this podcast. Shut up. The third. <laughs> yep, yep. yep. So Brother. introducing Mayor Paul Tenhagen. Hey. I was third on the list, huh? I gotta third. Get something to her, so, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, sir. Dude, I'm, I'm glad to be with you guys. And I, I must say, and people can see because there's a video component of this podcast as well, you guys got a sweet studio. And I do a lot Thank of you. podcasts. What people can't see because the cameras are turned around is there's a Peloton with a lot of stuff on it. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it's hardly getting used back there. So uh, uh, that's called the, yeah. That's why uh, your wife's beating you at golf. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I thought I could hide it with all the stuff on it, but yeah. clearly it's visible. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, yes. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you for coming on the show today. We kind of want to jump into things. I know we have busy schedule here, and how we start with our guests is taking it back to the beginning. Yeah. So if you can take it back to the beginning for you, kind of where you come from, how it was like growing up and yeah, just yeah. Kind of dive into that. Yeah. Well, again, uh, great to be on with you guys. I uh, love the title of the podcast. We're going to, going to hit today. Uh, Cause a lot of the topics I think we're going to touch on are near and dear to my heart as mm -hmm. mayor. Sure. Uh, I grew up in Worthington, Minnesota. So for listeners, that's about an hour from Sioux Falls over across the border in Minnesota. I grew up there my whole life. Plutonic, two-parent family. Uh, I went to a small Christian high school uh, right outside of Worthington. I had okay. 13 kids in my graduating class. Wow. Went to prom with my sister. <laughs> that's crazy. No, that's a joke. I did. Super, super this small. Is small town. <laughs> yeah, thir 13 people. I understand. <laughs> super small. Um, and from there, I grew up in the middle of three boys. During that time, something I should probably hit on, uh, during my time in high school and, and living in Worthington, my dad served on the city council in Worthington for a lot of years. So mm. I got to kind of see politics, uh, local politics from uh, from the kitchen table from our house and seeing his role in serving the community there. Uh, and so I went to uh, Dort University, as we mentioned, and graduated there in 2000 with a degree in graphic design. Okay. Mm. And in 2000... You, know, you guys are a lot younger than me. I'm 45, but in 2000, the internet was a brand new. The mm -hmm. web web design was a brand new field. Websites were a brand new thing, and I wanted to ride this web wave, the dot com wave that was taking off. So uh, that's where I went to school for web design, and 
graduated from door 2000 and i chased a girl up here okay uh, named jill and i married her very nice So we've been married 24 years congratulations Is Jill yeah. from sioux falls she's from northwest iowa i'm okay. down at college sure and i worked in marketing and did web design and marketing for several years in sioux falls before starting my own company in 08 uh, obama had just won the white house in 08 and he had used digital marketing, digital mm-hmm. technology, mm-hmm. social media, which was a new term then. He'd use social media like candidates had never seen before. And uh, micro donations and these things that he wasn't supposed mm-hmm. to win that race, and he won, and he used technology in a way that no candidate had ever done. Mm-hmm. And I saw that happening, and I saw what was happening with social media and thought, hey, I think there's a space for this. And I think there's a space for a company here that can help businesses understand what social media is. So I started a company then. In 08, uh, I did that for 10 years. Absolutely loved it, loved every minute of it. But for reasons we'll probably talk about later, decided to leave that company to run for this office. Yeah. And I did, and I got elected in 08. I'm in my second term now as mayor of the 121st largest city in the country. So I got two and a half years left. Okay. Uh, you, you have term limits in this sure. office, so you can serve two four-year terms. So mm. May of uh, 2026... I'm going to be unemployed ex-politician, so <laughs> mm. I need a job. So there keep me go. in mind. All right. We will. <laughs> Might need some help with that uh, right. website. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, awesome. So it sounds like you had, you know, growing up, you had really the what people kind of see when they think of, quote, unquote, perfect family, right? Mm-hmm. Where you, uh, Were you a religious family as well? I totally did, yeah. I We did have a very, nor- I had a very, quote, unquote, normal upbringing, sure. you know? Mm-hmm. Parents were never separated or divorced, so two-parent home. Yeah, very Christian home. But I, I, like I said, I did grow up in Worthington. And Worthington, if you know Worthington, Minnesota, very, very diverse community. Mm-hmm. Uh, super diverse. And so grew up in, uh, at one point, Worthington was considered the most diverse city in all of Minnesota. Even wow. before the Somali population, other things really took off in Minneapolis. Worthington mm-hmm. had the most diverse school district in the country, or in, this, in the state. Wow. So from that standpoint, uh, we had a, you know, a Laotian group that would meet in our church. I mentored a Laotian guy through through high school, teaching him English as a second language. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of my initial exposure to to more diverse populations in in my life. Yeah. You know, because I'm in a white house and uh, you know school. There was no diversity in my school as a Christian school, mm-hmm. so I had to kind of seek it out in, in different ways. Uh, and so. Some of that, as I look back on my life, I mean, some of those situations I could put in, whether that was teaching ESL to his name was Fook to, to Fook or who, whatever, kind of start to lay the framework for the role I'm in today and kind of gave me some experiences I think have served me well in, in sure. this role. Yeah, that's very cool. So, you know, you mentioned diversity and whatnot. Obviously, Zacchaeus and I, we've mentioned in multiple of our episodes that we're not originally from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I am. Uh, sorry, my apologies. Yes. No. Uh, your family oh, from sure. yep my apologies i should be more specific on that there but as we came and grew up into the city here we also i mean we're kind of in, in diversity uh, on a difference on a different aspect of it you know obviously as far as the schools and the community that we grew up in we we weren't seen as the 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 normal kids yeah. there obviously i'm black you're half black yep. or you know being in that diverse culture, being on the opposite end of it, can you tell us exactly how was that for you? Yeah. Well, um, first off, how old are you? I am 29. 29. And you went to high school here in Sioux Falls. I did. Okay. So, yeah. So, 10 years ago, the diversity in our high school system very different than it is today. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, I went to Wash, or to Roosevelt uh, last week and spoke to three different classes, and I bet 60 to 70% of each of those classrooms I was in were kids of diverse backgrounds, Mm -hmm. you know? And so the school district has changed tremendously. So even in the 10 years, 11 years since you've been out of high school, we've seen a big change in that. For me growing up, like I said, my diversity and and exposure to diversity in a town like Worthington, because I was in a Christian kind of white high school, Mm -hmm. was through different friend groups outside of high school, through different church experiences where, like I said, we had a Laotian Sudanese church that would meet in our church and we'd Mm. volunteer and and work with them. But really where I've gotten thrown into kind of the diversity pool has once I got into this job, and Mm -hmm. so fast forward now to as mayor, 
it's opened my eyes to the cultural fabric of this community Mm -hmm. uh, in that there's a lot of people in Sioux Falls that uh, live in their same circles, go to church with the same people, go to dinner with the same people, drive the same routes to and from work, Mm -hmm. and never see parts of our community or people in our community um, that are different than them. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's it's changing. That's certainly changing. There's more collisions that are happening like that. Um, But we still got quite a ways to go, I think, to expose people who maybe haven't had a lot of those diverse collisions in their life cycles for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we have a long ways to go with that in Sioux Falls. So that's why when I can be on podcasts like this, talk with you guys, talk about your backgrounds, yeah. your experiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very valuable to me as uh, I seek to continue to lead a city that is probably 50-50 mm-hmm. R's and D's when you mm-hmm. look at Republican Democrats. We are a snapshot right. of America. Mm-hmm. If you look at the diverse makeup, the diversity makeup, the political makeup, the socioeconomic makeup of Sioux Falls, this city is a mini snapshot of America. For sure. Uh, and that that's really unique. It's also very hard to lead it in that way mm-hmm. when you have uh, a city that quite honestly is split down the middle on a lot of different things. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I lived in Las Vegas, that was one thing I remember going to school out there is how diverse it was. There's so much, it's just a melting pot of people. And I'm glad you brought it up about the schools here in Sioux Falls. Um, And this kind of leads into something I want to talk about, about like um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? So but with the schools, it was a few years ago, they were doing a lot of different like uh, Zoom webinars. We were in COVID and a lot of it was centered around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they did a percentage um, within our school district and how numbers have changed so much from like 10 years ago to where they're at now. And I personally, I think it's a beautiful thing to see. It is a melting pot here and it's becoming more so for you. Something I've been heard on the grapevine when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion is that that was something that you really wanted to bring into Sioux Falls and kind of create a culture that empowers that movement. Is that true for one as something that you wanted to bring here? But um, on top of that, why is that so important? Well, it's a great, great question um, and great point in that our, our school district today, if, I mean, if you look at the demographic makeup of the kids in, the, I don't know, I'll pick on the Sioux Falls school district. We have, I think, eight or nine school districts that actually are within city limits. Right. Harrisburg and Brandon and T mm-hmm, and yeah. West Central Tri Valley, but obviously the big one being Sioux Falls. Like 40, 45% of kids in the Sioux Falls School District, K-12, are of diverse backgrounds. Right. Almost half. That's, uh, yeah. And you go back 20 years ago, um, that was in the teens. Mm-hmm. So you've seen the massive shift that's happening. So as a leader of the city, I feel it's my job to make sure that this community is empowering, embracing, giving people of all different backgrounds, races, creeds, religions, uh, equal opportunities to succeed in the community. Sure. And because that's very important. Where I see a lack of that right now is in the, in the boardrooms, you know, because a lot of the diversity we talk about this lives in the school district. That's why you guys kind of OGs as, as diverse members of the community 10, 12 years ago. Well, fast forward when you're 39 and mm-hmm. 10 years from now, Mm-hmm. All these kids that I talked to at Roosevelt that I said last week, I mean, those kids are going to be 28, 20. They're going to be the Dequans of the world. Right. And we're going to have a very diverse community. Mm-hmm. And so this community is hungry for more diversity in leadership roles and boardroom roles. Um, it's just not quite there yet. There's not like, this huge boom of, of diverse uh, of diverse business leaders, but they're coming in a, in a big tsunami, I feel. Right. And so I think it's important that we prepare for that and say, okay, what are we doing with policies, programs, opportunities, things like the Leaders of Tomorrow program that my friends Tammy and Vani put on at Think3D to mm-hmm. empower the next generation of leaders with the skills, the yeah. confidence they need to be mm-hmm. the future mayors, future city councilors, future business leaders yeah. in mm-hmm. the city. And that is a great course. I graduated from that last fall and... Just a shout out to those guys. It is awesome. It's not like completely mind blowing information, but it's stuff that you easily will overlook and can make the biggest change with just the words that you're saying. Like power of the tongue is a episode that we have. And that's yeah. something that we learned a lot about in leaders of tomorrow, where literally everything that we're saying has so much of an impact, not only on people around us, but ourselves as well. Yeah. 
I'm really and they glad. talk a lot in their programs too about the price of particip- opinion being participation. So the price of an opinion is participation. So if you want to mm-hmm. have an opinion on how the mayor's doing his job or how Joe Biden's doing his job or the school district's doing their job, well, then you got to participate and get involved. Right, right. It's easy to be a keyboard warrior on Facebook and just say, look at this clown. Look what he's, how, what are you doing in your community then to mm-hmm. improve that and to make mm-hmm. this better and to put a podcast together? Like, like you guys are, you have a lot of things you could be doing in your time, including golf games, sounds hmm. like. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very much so. You know, when you're spending time, energy, you're even giving up this great room specifically for a studio, podcast studio, and specifically to lift up important issues in the community. Like that is participation. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of people that are doing this sort of thing. So um, we need more people like this that are doing things like this, having conversations like this. For Appreciate sure. that. You know, that actually kind of moves me into my next question, actually. Now, you said that you went to Dort and it was graphic design. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, There were a few things once you graduated college, of course, that you achieved. Uh, One being, of course, starting your own uh, marketing and uh, social. Well, sorry. What would you put? Uh, We call it digital marketing. Digital marketing. Okay. Company. Um, You were also the mascot. For the Uh-oh. yeah, I'm let's let's uh, yeah. Actually, I do want to. <laughs> I want to get into that because you've. There's one thing that we talk about, and that's just as far as people's journeys, how things kind of work out for you, and it leads you to where you are today. You know, obviously, you started your digital marketing mascot. There was things in between there that you did before you actually became the mayor, and yeah. I want to talk about those. Like, yeah. what kind of led you into um, those specific job fields? Well, you know what? Um, I'll start with. Housing, because <laughs> okay. I'm going to come back to this. Yeah, we talk about housing now, and housing is expensive, and you're in the mortgage space, and it's tough for people to find a, a home. Yeah. Well, back when we were in the early 2000s, my wife and I were were looking for a home. It was expensive for us, and we were trying to figure out how to make this work. And I had just graduated from college with this degree in graphic design, had a job, was making not great money, but I knew we wanted to get a place, and so. I moonlighted a second job I got was as a mascot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was a mascot for the Sioux Falls Sky Force. And now I loved it. It was fun. But I mean, I would work, you know, eight to four. And then I would go and put on a wolf costume from 4.30 to 10 p.m., mm-hmm. shower with the refs mm-hmm. and go to work the next day. And I was hustling and it was, it was to make money. I wanted the money yep. right. because we wanted to get a house. We had to come up with a down payment. and And so... I think sometimes today we get a little bit too comfortable and entitled, like, hey, I should have the American dream. I mm-hmm. work 40 hours a week and houses aren't affordable. It's like, I wouldn't have been able to afford a house, neither my wife or I, had we not done all these other things. She moonlighted and did a side gig as well in addition to her real job. We worked our rear ends off, mm-hmm. you know, to try and get ahead, and it was hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that work ethic, I think, was was modeled for me though by my parents and mm-hmm. and I also realized that not a lot of uh, people grow up in a you know plutonic household with a, a father that shows them the right work ethic and hey when your word is your bond and mm-hmm. some people grow up even without a dad to model that way or a mom right. for that matter uh, and so early on in my, my professional journey I just was very driven I wanted to get ahead I wanted to work hard so yeah moonlighting as a mascot big saver i mean mm-hmm. we God, we saved every penny and we would have you know ramen dates and all this stuff and <laughs> and that was kind of formed i think a special time in our marriage too when we were connecting over that frugality almost mm-hmm. sure it was mm-hmm. like something we shared together uh we're never on the dave ramsey train you know right. which mm-hmm. uh i'm not that i'm not that crazy <laughs> you know mm-hmm. but uh, right. but we were also just very smart with finances and, and what we did to, to get us where we are. That's awesome. Love it. How important, and this is kind of not a topic, but how important has your wife been as more than just a wife, but as that support from college, you know, through COVID, I'm sure that wasn't easy for you. Um, and now to where we're at today. Can you talk about that? Yeah. As well? I mean, you got, I see you got a ring. Are you married? Yep, I'm married as oh, well. All right. So we're in the marriage trust tree here. Like, <laughs> yep. I tell you, if, if your wife is not fully committed to what you want to do and be and become as a man, it's very hard. If she's not on board with, hey, why you got to go do this podcast? And hey, why you have to go? Because it's in me. 
Honey, mm-hmm. there's a fire in me, and I feel called to do this. And if she's not supporting you in that, the journey's going to be very hard. So specifically mm-hmm. with me in politics, my wife's not a political person. She doesn't like the spotlight, but she knows this is something I just had to do. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I think there's a lot of other things you could do, but I know you want to do this. I know God's called you to do this, and I'm going to walk alongside you in this. And there's been times in the last three years specifically since 2020 when we've questioned like what are we doing man why did we do this why did we take this plunge because it's been really really hard yeah and each time my wife reinforces to me she's like paul you were made to do this you got to hang in there you got to do this and i tell you what there's no better feeling than when your wife reinforces your calling and supports you as yeah. a man like mm-hmm. man i feel like i could walk through walls when she's right. like i believe in you mm-hmm. a guy can say that to me or a coworker, but when your spouse says that to you right it's it's an awesome feeling mm-hmm. it's all that validation that you need to keep going it we is do. and men we we put on this facade like we're we're tough and you know we're steel and we're the we're the head of our house and we are but we need support and we need care and love and affection and that reinforcement and validation to say, hey, honey, you're doing a good job. Thanks for providing. Thanks for doing this. I know it's yeah. hard. Mm-hmm. We maybe act like we don't need that, but we need that. We and definitely we do. Need do. That. Definitely shout out to the wives out there that are very supportive yeah, and whatnot, yeah. as well as the husbands as well, because, I mean, our wives, they have goals and ambitions that we need to stand behind them as well um, and give them that support as well. And that's just how yeah. companionship and relationships work. So mm-hmm. think about that. If we need that, our wives need that. Probably even more because uh, mm. I just think how hard it is today to be a working female mom in this society with how nuts kids' activities are and how difficult managing a home is and all these things. And and wives feel a lot of that responsibility. And so if we're not continually lifting up and encouraging them and saying, hey, you're enough. We don't have to do this. The house is a mess. It's fine. We don't need to go to this event tonight. You just chill out. Right. Being a good husband to our wives, and I think it's hard to be a working mom today. Mm-hmm. For so sure. hard right now. Mm-hmm. Um, they need that validation from us, just like we need it from them. Agreed. I agree 100%. I oftentimes, I think, and it was when we had our first child. Well, we only have one right now, but second on the way. And I'm just trying to say, like, how do single parents or just women in general do this like it is a lot especially when you are upkeep in the home and making sure your husband's mental is is good as well checking on them taking Mm -hmm. care of the kids just everything so big shout out to the women in all of our lives uh keeping us going yeah absolutely keeping us going um but i want to get into the we talked about a little bit your process of wanting to buy a home i want to talk about the affordable housing right now being a mortgage advisor, I see it every day. I see people that come in that are in a great position to buy a home. They're able to either get in a program or they have the money. And then there's people that come to me where I'm like, I have to, you know, tell them my professional opinion that, hey, like, it's probably not the best idea right now for you. Either way, though, whether they're renting or they're buying, it is becoming an issue for people to find affordable housing. Is that something that you and like your administration, you guys talk about very often on kind of how to combat that or kind of a plan moving forward for people? I would say, and I, I'm not exaggerating, there's probably not a day that goes by in this office when housing is not a discussion at some point. Hmm. It's, it's talked about constantly. The, the challenge with housing and affordable housing, uh, and, and that can mean whatever you want it to mean. For what, sure. is, what is affordable housing? Well, there's HUD guidelines and what the government says is affordable, and then there's what's realistic. The housing market relies on so many factors, and, and let me just, I'll lay some out, out for you. There's, there's interest rates, which you know well. City has no control over that. Mm-hmm. There's supply chain issues. Mm-hmm. Um, city has no control over that. Uh, there's workforce issues, just literally getting people in the trades who want to build and do electrical work and right. plumbing work. Um, we have some control over that, but that's a bit of a societal shift as well. Mm-hmm. So you have three huge factors there in the cost, the supply chain, and then you have inflation on those materials. So even mm-hmm. if the supply chain was working normally, wood is now 30% more than it was, you know, pre-pandemic. Yeah. So 
sometimes it feels like some of the programs we put in place were just, you know, dropping a cup of water into the ocean. It's like, mm-hmm. man, we, we can make a little change here. We could reduce some fees to the builders here, but bottom line, there's so many headwinds. So last yeah. night's a good example. Last night our city council meeting, we appropriated four million bucks towards affordable housing programs in the in the city. Four million is a lot of a lot for our city budget to yeah. handle to put an additional four million to help with units in that thirty to forty percent AMI. Mm. Now um, it's why you're seeing so much multifamily being built in this community. I mean there's multifamily everywhere. Mm-hmm. I mean you go you guys are you know, your studio's on the west side of Sioux Falls, and you go down the west side of Sioux Falls, T. Ellis Road, there's just apartment complexes yep. and townhomes and twin homes everywhere mm-hmm. because those can be built and can get people in those at a more affordable rate. So For sure. When you talk about poverty, and, you know, when you the, the title of this podcast being Overstepping Poverty, one of the core things people need to, to be successful in society and have a life that um, is, is productive and happy is stable housing Mm -hmm. if you don't know where your next where where your next night stay is going to be or you don't have stable housing not a lot else matters right that's why that's a very important issue to us we took we talk about a housing first approach we take at the city that you may have mental health challenges or addiction challenges and but if you don't know where you're going to stay that night you're not worried about going and seeing a counselor right. and getting addiction help because mm-hmm. your mind is on, where am I going to sleep tonight? Yeah, survival. Yeah. yeah. So housing for me takes the form of everything from homeless crisis shelters all the way up to, do we need move up holding housing for people in that seven, $800,000? I mean, they'll, they'll, we need housing there too. Everywhere, mm-hmm. yeah. No, my heart is less sympathetic for those folks. Sure. You know? mm-hmm. And more on the lower end is really where the needs are manifesting themselves. For sure. No, I think it it's not something that is going to be fixed overnight, obviously. And there was a realtor I was talking to over the last few weeks, and his understanding where there is contracts on apartments and multifamily homes out to like 2026. Yeah. And that's just kind of to stay ahead of how many people are still going to continue to move to this area. So, uh, yeah, we'll definitely see what happens. But I'm going to give you a real example, you guys. I'm going yeah. my phone. Okay. I got an email as I pulled in, uh, pulled in your studio here today Sure. from a resident. And this, uh, welcome to my life here. This resident says, Dear Mayor, I wonder if you realize how the residents feel about the current growth of Sioux Falls. Do you know how often we laugh and shake our heads at all the banks, car washes, and clinics every block and a half? I've never seen another city like it. Some city planning or better let yet lack thereof. Just build any everywhere and everywhere. Worry about the consequences later. And just railing on me because mm. the city is growing. Well, the, the city is growing. Right. Mm. And do I wish sometimes we could slow it down? Of course I do. Mm-hmm. Because we're trying to keep up. But the way you make a city stop growing is you make it a city that sucks. Mm-hmm. Right. And high crime, bad education, terrible roads, high taxes. Like I can show you cities that have figured that formula out right. and they're shrinking and they're people are coming here because we have good schools. We have good infrastructure. We have good people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's hard to balance that out. You can't just put a wall around a city and say, all right, we're going to stop growing for this year and just get everything taken care of. And then we'll lift the wall again. That's just not how it works. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a delicate balance and housing is probably the biggest thing we have to try and keep up with through that growth. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Just as far as like, Obviously, affordable housing, that's one of your goals, of course, uh, while you're elected mayor, as well as uh, your council's goals there. I'm assuming just to be successful in what you're doing, you have to have multiple goals, not only for yourself, but also for the city. You know, these goals and ambitions. What are some other goals that you have, of course, while you're in office? So we use what we call the One Sioux Falls Framework for our administration and it's kind of like a litmus test that we we use to determine what initiatives we're going to chase down because what happens in this job is every day every week every month people are reaching out saying hey we should get a new baseball stadium hey we should bring a trader joe's here hey we should do all these things and it's like those are all great but if if you don't have priorities in life, you just end up spinning your head and it's on a swivel and you chase everything. So our mm-hmm. four priorities are this. We talked about one, which is housing. The second frame of the, of the One Who Falls framework or the second pillar of that 
uh, is public safety and health, mm-hmm. and specifically around public safety, which we put this framework in place pre-2020 during social justice, George Floyd's murder, what has happened with public safety and specifically with caps and mm-hmm. law enforcement has created, and you've seen it in some communities, very challenging public safety environments. But a community, a city wants to know that it's safe. That's like right. residents' number one expectation. Right. The two big things are, we expect if we go out and go to the bathroom right now, that toilet better flush and that water better come on. Mm-hmm. Like the infrastructure better work. Mm-hmm. And we better feel safe. Mm-hmm. I call 911. The cops better show up. There better be low crime. Mm-hmm. And I spend time daily working on that issue as well. How do we keep Sioux Falls feeling safe? And inevitably, as the city grows, crime grows. I mean, right, when, sure. when you add 10,000 people in two years, they're not all choir boys. Right. You know, <laughs> you get some challenging people. So how do we make sure that it still feels safe even despite that growth? Mm-hmm. So that's the second thing is... is uh, public safety the third is workforce Uh, we spend a lot of time figuring out how do we get an adequate workforce to fill all the jobs we have in this community we have 1.7 percent unemployment Um, we have the one of the lowest unemployment rates in the entire country and that's good in some ways it's bad in other ways which Mm -hmm. means there's a lot of companies that just need workers bad Sure. What can I do as a mayor to do that? Well, we can build a city that people want to come to, want right. to live in, uh, want to move to. That's investing in parks. That's working with our school district partners. That's working with uh, different folks in the community to make sure we're recruiting the t- right types of businesses, the right types of jobs that pay well. Yeah. And then that last pillar, so I talked about housing, workforce, public safety. That fourth one is what we call kids and families. Mm-hmm. So I believe that a community that takes care of kids is a good community for everybody. It doesn't mean we ignore senior citizens and it does ignore, we, we ignore you know, families even, but if kids are successful, meaning they're going to school fed, they're getting a good education, they're getting mentoring opportunities, they have good out of school programming options, they can play sports leagues, they have good transportation to get there. Mm-hmm. Think if the community had all those things met for every kid, that would be a utopian community. For sure. yeah. Right. And think what those kids are going to turn into. So we use that lens a lot when we're making decisions like, hey, is this right for kids? Because if this is good for the kids, this is good for the community. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the priorities that we we work on in in my office. Yeah, I love that. You know, and I kind of actually want to go into more on a personal note as well, just to, of course, your continued success and what you're doing. How important is it for you to have goals and ambitions. Man, I I will tell you that if you want to be successful in life, whether you are, you know, teenager, whether you're 75 years old, if you're not setting goals for yourself of things you want to achieve, uh, you will fall into a stagnancy that uh, is hard to get out of. And even me, I have, uh, I'm going to climb Kilimanjaro next year. Wow. Okay. Very nice. Let's I set go. a goal for it. I'm announcing on this podcast, my chief of staff, my <laughs> office doesn't even know this yet. So, um, And you know why I'm going to do that? Because I want to train for it. Training keeps me in shape. And I know that when I train, I spend time in the word and I listen to podcasts mm-hmm. and I sharpen my mind. So it's not the fact that I want to climb this mountain. I want to do all the things that lead up to that, that will keep my body sharp, keep my mind sharp, keep my spiritual life sharp. If, if I don't have that goal, it's easy to not get out of bed at five in the morning and just sleep in. And, but when you know, it's like, I got to climb that thing. Right. I got to get my rear out of bed to get on the stair stepper and kind of get at it. And so goals to me, I'm a huge goal guy. I write mm-hmm. them down every year. I set goals every year that I want to accomplish. My wife is different. So mm-hmm. she's sometimes, um, not that she's not a goal setter, but I'm a very driven person like that. And mm-hmm. uh, it kind of, uh, comes across my parenting style at times and my uh, home leadership style. And sometimes <laughs> sure. I have to remind myself that, hey, not everybody is as type A as I am yep. and a goal setter like me. But if you if you have people around you in your life that you admire, that you said, that person really uh, seems to have it, have it together. I wonder what their secret is. I will bet you two things are true about them. One, I bet they're an early riser. Mm-hmm. I bet they get up early. Mm-hmm. And two, I bet they set personal and professional goals. Yep. 
So sure. professional goals mean, hey, I want to get here in my career. I want to try and achieve this income status. But more importantly, those personal goals. I want to read the Bible every day. I want to run this race next year. Uh, I want to go on a date every once a month, at least with my wife, no yep. kids, like those yeah. things. So, yeah, you know, and I, I thank you for sharing that because it actually led me, led us into my next question as far as you're working out. And of course, what I believe is physical health is, is definitely a main priority and it should be a main priority for everyone because it also leads into like your mental health and your well being. That's how you're able to continue to be a, a hungry, a successful person, someone that wants more, I feel like in life, in my opinion. Um, but you had set out while in your term that you wanted this city to be one of the fittest cities, you know, in America. I want to know exactly how that's going. What are you guys doing uh, more of to make sure that that is a goal that's met? Yeah. So that it's kind of a platitudinal statement because, like, how do we ever determine if we are? Right. I mean, Men's Health will do some studies and say, "Oh, Miami's the fit." They look at the fast food per capita and all this mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, I feel like it's important to use my bully pulpit to encourage people to get active. Mm-hmm. So we we do the hundred miles, hundred days challenge every year, where I get people out and encourage them to log a hundred miles in a hundred days. We're investing. If you look at my budget that I bring forward as the city, you'll see investments in our park assets, bike yep. trails new fitness court that we just opened uh, along the bike trail next month we are going to be opening and launching a mobile food market which provide healthy food options to lower income neighborhoods so unfortunately what happens in food deserts or lower income neighborhoods not only do they not have access to grocery stores nearby we call them food deserts uh, if they do get to a grocery store one of the most expensive aisles is the produce aisle right and so think of a bookmobile, but full of food instead of mm. books. And we'll be able to take this to neighborhoods. It's not free, mm-hmm. right. but it's very, very reduced cost yep. market that people can buy peppers and they can buy bananas and they can you know, buy some meat and cheese and milk and eggs and other things at a, at a heavily subsidized cost. Mm-hmm. And that's important to me because there's a dignity that goes with purchasing something. I mean, mm-hmm. if... If I came to you, let's say you were struggling to Quan and uh, you know, you're between jobs and I said, Hey, I wanna I wanna give you free food for you and your family, you would say, I'm a man, I wanna I wanna be able to provide for me. There's some dignity that goes with me right. providing and you'd feel like less of a person. Mm-hmm. But if I could say, Hey, I want you to come you can come buy some food from this market, it's you still gotta pay, it's subsidized. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm still providing for my family. There's still mm-hmm. some dignity behind that. And so that's not to say we don't need free giveaways and those are right. important as well. But when people can purchase, they want to purchase. Right. Uh, and I get a chance to go to Haiti a lot. And that's the one thing the Haitian people um, we assume they want our old T-shirts and our old sneakers and their old stuff. It's like, no, they want to provide for their families just like you want to provide for your family. Mm-hmm. Right. They don't want people coming down from America like, hey, you want my old Nikes? Like, no, right. I want to be able to buy new Nikes just like you can do. Yeah. And so I always look at it with, with that lens. So bringing that all back to how do we become the fittest city in America, the the secondary rationale behind wanting to be fit physically is physical fitness is so good for your mind. Yep. And our mental health and our physical health are studies everywhere that shows the direct connection between those. And 2020 was a year of CPR, COVID, political tensions, racial tensions, mm-hmm. all in one year. And what I saw is the fallout, and we're still seeing it today, is the mental health issues that were created from that year of CPR. Um, right. Suicides, uh, big challenge. I mean, we we had, we had 22 last year in the city. We have a 26 year to date already. It's wow. September you know, 12 and we're recording this. So if we have a homicide in our city. I mean, that's a big deal. The news covers mm-hmm. it. We've had 26 people mm-hmm. take their own life already in this city. Right. And you don't hear about it because we don't report on it. The media doesn't cover that and we don't want them to. But there are mental health challenges that people are struggling with. And one of the best ways to get on top of those it's not necessarily medications. It's starting to take care of your body, getting out, getting active, and changing your mindset. Absolutely. And that is actually um, something that we covered in one of our very beginning episodes, you know, physical and mental health. A better you is better for everyone. Yeah. You know, so it, it's definitely important to our viewers and listeners out there for you guys to make sure you're okay. You know, make sure that you're doing things to make your body's healthy and that your your mental health, your everything, just you in general is is healthy and 100 percent every single day and i gotta put in a plug man anybody listening having 
tough thoughts, mental health challenges, suicidal thoughts, 988. I mean, you can now call 988. You pick up your phone and call 988. Mm. And someone is waiting on the other end of that phone to take your call, talk you through whatever's going on, link you up with a challenge. When you have a suicidal ideation, you feel like you are alone in the world. And mm-hmm. I tell you, there's always someone there. There's always someone there. Mm-hmm. You just need to ask. So yep. anyway, listen, 988, a great resource. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That That is big. And I think that that um, is something we need more of. We had somebody on, a good friend of mine, who kind of was transitioning out of the military and coming mm-hmm. back into society as a civilian and Um, not that he had any suicidal thoughts or anything like that, but he did talk about the struggles of that transition and people just not really feeling like they have anybody to talk to. So Mm -hmm. I appreciate you sharing that nine, eight, eight for, uh, people out there, share that with your friends, family, make sure that they know that that resource is available because that could literally be the difference between life and death for somebody. So What are you and your administration doing to fight poverty, mental illness, affordable housing, addiction, and homelessness? Holy cow. I know. There's quite a few. There's quite a few things. We talked about a few. There there is. We did talk about a few of those, but if there's a few things in there that you can pull out of that, um, their comment on that is just that it's it's sad that our skyline is growing just as fast as the numbers of people living on the same streets underneath that skyline. One thing I would say to that is the per capita numbers of our homeless count hasn't changed okay so what that means is let's say we have i don't know what the per capita number would be let's say four homeless people for every 1,000 residents Mm -hmm. okay if you add 5,000 residents in a year that's 20 more homeless people you're going to have right but the per capita is you look at a san francisco denver Mm -hmm. chicago new york their per capita is increasing Mm -hmm. so they're not getting a handle on that so uh, I will say that there's a few things, and there's a whole list of stuff you listed there, and what are we doing in all those areas. One of the biggest challenges with the homeless community is that a majority of them are dealing with underlying substance abuse or mental health problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so getting them a place to stay is important. And like I said, a kind of a housing-first approach, but we mm-hmm. have to then also make sure that they can keep that house and sure. keep that apartment by taking care of the other challenges they're wrestling with. So mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, now two, almost two and a half years ago, we opened a place downtown called The Link, which was, yeah. I tell you guys, it was, a, it was a Herculean effort to get that place open. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a four-way partnership between Sanford Avera, City of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County. Mm. And that may not sound like a big deal, but to get those four all to play together, mm-hmm. even Sanford and Nevera, and I love them. Right. But, but I mean, that's uh, Hatfields and McCoys. You know, they got, right. they got separate goals, but they mm. come together. We fund the thing. And that place helps people dealing with chronic addiction issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, we had one guy that we served there. We served him 53 times. He came through the link. And like mm-hmm. on the 54th or 55th time, he finally decided to go get treatment. So wow. it's not as easy as just going up to a homeless person and saying, hey, I'd like to give you this house. I'd like to give you this apartment and putting more apartments in place. There's all kinds of underlying issues that have to be dealt with mm-hmm. in order for that person to have to, to make that a successful situation. So yeah. uh, the link is one, one of those. We also just funded... $400,000 recently for what we call a street team out street team outreach program with uh, partners at South Dakota Urban Indian Health. Mm. Um, we have a lot of, of Native Americans in this community that are dealing with homelessness. I mean, disproportionate amount of our homeless community is, is Native. And so the street team will be able to go out and meet people where they're at in the street. Mm-hmm. Why are you here? What's going on? What issues are you sh- wrestling with? How can we help? Is there a family or a relative or something that we can reach out to that can provide you some help and assistance sure. rather than just driving past them and dealing with them when it finally becomes a cop issue? Mm-hmm. Hopefully we can deal with that challenge before it ends up, you know, in the back of a squad car and we can right. figure out what the challenge is. So mm-hmm. there's there's no home runs with those issues. There's right. just singles, whether it's the link, whether it's street teams, whether we appropriated more money to Bishop Dudley last night at our council meeting to help with some of their costs. Mm. Singles, singles, singles. You can win ball games with singles. For sure. Um, but everybody wants a home run, just like they do with housing and child care. And it's like there's not home runs to be found. But we'll, just, we'll keep doing these small things that are hopefully making big impact. Yep. For sure. And, you know, they say Rome wasn't built overnight. You know, it's just nice to know that 
things are their steps, you know, going forward that we are trying to do um, as a community to make sure that as a community, it's better for everyone. Yeah. So I think uh, from that question there, they just wanted to know exactly what, what the steps were. So yeah. appreciate you asking. Yeah, and what, what's interesting that. is we don't, I don't think we do a good job, a good enough job of covering all the things that are being done for, on some of those issues. Mm-hmm. Because what people will see is they'll, you know, see two panhandlers in the stretch of four blocks and they'll go right to my Facebook page and say, panhandlers are everywhere. What are you doing about it? Mm-hmm. Well, there is stuff to be doing about it, but these are, these are what we call big, hairy problems. I mean, they're, they're not as easy as just saying, well, ban panhandling. Well, you can't. It's protected by the First Amendment. So mm-hmm. people can panhandle. Right. Um, but the root cause of that panhandling is what we have to look at. Why is that person having a panhandle? Right. So the, it's not that they need 2 or $3. Why are they? Why do they need those 2 or $3? Mm-hmm. Is there an addiction issue there? Is there a work challenge there? Is there a housing issue there? Is there a mental health issue we have to deal with? Uh, the easy thing is always to give someone $5. The hard thing would be to pull over and say, hey, can I mentor you? Can I help you? Yep. And <laughs> and get dirty with you, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah. help figure out why you're in this situation. Well, Absolutely. And going back to what you said earlier about the participation, right? There, When I think about the where this podcast came from, it was far before when we had our first conversation on what we wanted to do. I think it started around the George Floyd time when there was so much civil unrest and you know, we're in our group chats talking to each other, like, what it, what can be done? Like, what can we change other than getting in the street and marching like we do every other time that this happens? What actual change can we create? And it births something like this. And it is important for people that do have complaints or wanting to see a change to actually do something about it rather than just talk about it. Yeah, right. Because we are more than capable to give a little bit of our time if we actually want to see that change. Yeah. And I think what that's most important. people will see with a problem is they see the, you know, the old iceberg example, they see the tip of the iceberg above the water mm-hmm. and then under the water is the massive iceberg mm-hmm. of all the issues that are leading up to that little tip you're seeing. Yep. So you are seeing a panhandler that underneath that is a whole bevy of physical, mental, emotional, housing, relational, spiritual issues that all need to be dealt with in different ways through different religions, different backgrounds, different trauma-informed approaches based on how Mm -hmm. the person was raised. So it's challenging. It's very challenging work. And honestly, the government is not always the best suited to solve those problems. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I talk a lot to a lot of churches and I say, hey, don't don't always point the finger at City Hall and say, well, what are you doing about it? Like, what's your church doing about it? Mm-hmm. What's, what's that faith-based community doing about it? You know, mm-hmm. when's the last time you had these people into your sanctuary or whatever it is? So yep. the church needs to also be the church in the community sure. like they, they've they been called to do for hundreds of years. Absolutely. The last question I think we have before we get into the roundtable topic is talking about politics and being a part of city council. And my first experience was when I went there, when it was on the Airbnb topic, but what I noticed in a lot of places that I noticed, and you touched on it a little bit is the lack of diversity when it comes to those city officials, I guess you could say from your point of view, what would you say would be, or just some advice for our community as we grow as we become more diverse how do we get people to represent what our community really looks like so that everybody i guess feels spoken for Mm -hmm. well i think it goes there's an important point though and that is just because someone's skin color is different let's just because i'm white doesn't mean i don't have a heart for and i'm serving the entirety of the community. And sometimes sure. we associate that we need a black guy on city council because who's representing the black community. Sure. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I always take that personally because I, I am, I'm representing this whole city. And to think mm-hmm. that I just am focused on one ethnic background or one, mm-hmm. you know, I realize I was never in the foster care system like Daquan and have a different set of experiences, but I also do it. I think an okay job of getting out into the community and trying to understand some of the key issues of different populations so that I can serve them well 
in that role. However, would it be great to have some more diversity in our in our elected leader positions? Of course. The best way to start that is to start getting involved. Even if it's just showing up to city council meetings, mm-hmm. just sitting there and watching. I mean, if you want to serve, you first have to see how it works. What sort of issues are they dealing with? Would I like this job? Could I do this job? Well, right. Say, okay, I would like to do that. Now maybe is there a board I could sit on? Mm-hmm. Could I reach out to the mayor's office and say, hey, I think I bring a different perspective to the city. Do you have any boards that deal with poverty, that deal with kids' issues, that deal with public transit, I'd like to serve. Mm. And I have 60, I think 60 different boards or something like that where I point people to. Okay. Uh, and so there's opportunities to get your foot in and say, okay, now I'm making a difference here and I'm building a brand for myself and I'm meeting different people. And none of those people on that council just decided, hey, I want to be an elected official. And they just ran and got elected. They, right. If I look at all their paths, they got long history of getting involved and putting their hand up and serving in boards and serving mm-hmm. in the city, building a brand and building a name that allowed them to get into the chairs they're in. Sure. So mm-hmm. it's yeah. the same path that I think anybody would need to take. Okay. Absolutely. I appreciate that. I think there's somebody that will take away from what you just said there, just the resource of reaching out and maybe understanding where is a place to start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it is getting on a board or coaching football or whatever it is, just getting involved. I think if people, if if Sioux Falls people listen to this and they want to get involved, if they email mayor at SiouxFalls.org and say, Hey, I'm such and such, I'm, I'm this age. I'm passionate about these things. I can put them in touch with a board application. Say, Hey, here's three or four boards. You'd be great to serve on. We'd love someone in your background and skill set. And next time we have an opening, we'll reach out. Yeah start the conversation i think that's good that's perfect well we definitely appreciate you answering all those questions that we had for you there now we actually or want to open it up now that you can ask us questions you know in this part of our episode we call it the round table so fire away whatever questions you have for zacchaeus well i I. guess you know when you guys reached out to me i'm like all right yeah i I looked in the podcast and i get asked to do a lot of podcasts and and you know be on different things and the topic or the title overstepping poverty immediately hit me and really just curious to know what what's the why the how did this come up how did this uh this podcast get started and what's driving you guys to you know want to give an hour Mm -hmm. of a weekday spending Mm -hmm. time doing this editing because this is work what's driving you to do this stuff yeah for me you know the and we've mentioned it before just with the title of overstepping poverty we talked a little bit before uh, we started to air this. But for me, the idea of poverty was something I didn't really want to attach to our name just because I felt like it had this negative connotation with it. And as I began to think about it and reflect on it, you know, it's poverty means so much to so many different people, right? For one person, it can be the real life experiences that they've gone through with physical poverty or another person, it could be their mental state or their spiritual state, stuff like that. So really the idea and why the drive and why we want to do something like this is for one, I feel like there's not enough real in-depth conversations that are had amongst men, amongst women that ultimately connects us. You know, there's so much that we have in common with people like you and I have way more in common than you know, somebody that has never talked to us would think, right? You're a Vikings fan. I'm a Vikings fan. We both have a good heart for wanting to see our community do good. And with that alone, there's so much work that can be done and so much better of a community we can have when these conversations are had. And at the same time, I feel like it gives people a platform to showcase their talent, showcase Mm -hmm. who they are, where they don't necessarily always have that experience. And especially in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, really the Midwest in general, it's really hard to get exposure to the outside world. You know, being here, we kind of get looked over. We're the flyover state. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a lot of awesome people in our community. So just giving them a place, a platform to showcase that and and ultimately bring everybody closer Mm -hmm. together. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and multiple people have asked us this question. They asked us why, and I usually give the exact same answer on there, but I want to answer this one differently with a question back of more of why not, you know, why not have different successful individuals on our podcast to air their journey, you know, and to, to tell us exactly how they got there. 
to let us know exactly that it's not easy to get to where you're at to be successful. It's not, it's not, it, you don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be successful and then become the person that is yeah. just great at what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, there it's a journey, it's a journey, you know, and, and why not really give the community Sioux Falls their own platform because we're a great community. We're a great city and there's not enough talk about our city. Mm-hmm. And so that's one thing that we want. We want to be talked about more as far as who we have in our city and the leaders and the business owners, the entrepreneurs, we want them to be talked about. We want them to be showcased because they have done so much for the city. And there's a lot of times like Zacchaeus has said in previous podcasts that people are getting talked about, getting views and whatnot, but they're not really doing anything, you know? Um, And so we wanted to make sure that we were here to actually do something and give back to the community rather than just talk about it. Well, here's, here's some encouragement I'll give you is, you know, you talked about how do you get involved and how, how would you ever serve in city council maybe or something like that. Well, you're doing a podcast now. Well, now you have the mayor on your podcast. Now mm-hmm. I've met you two guys. I've never met you before. Mm-hmm. So if you emailed me today, either of you, like, yeah, I know those guys. I know their heart. I you, We instantly now have a connection and a contact. Mm-hmm. And 10 years from now, you could be like, how did I ever get to this? Oh, yeah, we interviewed the mayor and he connected me with so-and-so. And it's like, Success just doesn't just happen. And you don't mm-hmm. just sit in your base and be like, why don't I have this opportunity? you got to go right. take permission. You know, instead of right. ask permission, like, I'm going to take it. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to just reach out to, to people. And so doing this, I think, is a, is a really great way to, you know, build your own brands even in this community as, as mm-hmm. people who obviously I can tell just from the hour we've been together, you have huge hearts for the city. And you're probably going to be in my short Rolodex of people I may need to reach out to for some some things. So appreciate that. Relationship and perspective, though, I think is the biggest thing that people can take away from this is understanding that, you know, in this instance, as the mayor, there's probably decisions that you make that you don't necessarily always want to make. Right. And there's things Mm, that you have to deal with (laughs) that you don't necessarily want to deal with. But from the outside looking in and you've mentioned it, it's oh, the mayor sucks, or he didn't do this, or he didn't do that, when if we're placed in a lot of the same positions of the people that we ridicule, we wouldn't be so hard on who we are. you know. And I think that that's something, it's just the perspective on things. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like you just said, building relationships are important. In the real estate world, it's like the real estate agents that don't reach out to anybody or call anybody they usually don't have deals they're not making money we call them secret agents because no one knows about them secret Mm -hmm. agents you know (laughs) hey it's not who it's not what you know it's who you know and i know that's Mm -hmm. a corny cliche it's so true man Mm -hmm. it's so true so it is yeah well yeah do you have any other questions for us you know I'll, i'll i'll close with this last one if you could give me three adjectives each of you to describe what you would like to see sioux falls be 10 years from now so fast forward 10 years from now we're growing at a crazy clip Mm mm-hmm how would you describe the Sioux Falls of 10 years from now in three adjectives in the ideal scenario? Oh, goodness. Zacchaeus, I'll do you want to take this one? First, uh, on. Oh, oh, oh wow. you both got, Well, I'll maybe start. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I would say I would like to see us be uh, healthy. Mm-hmm. I would like to see us be united uh, in a time when, honestly, we are being told we have to be angry and divided on everything. I'd mm-hmm. like to see us be united. And I would like to see us be thriving. I think when you when you have a when you describe a community as thriving, that means a lot of things are working economically, mm-hmm. um, spiritually. People say hi to you when you walk down the street. So if we are thriving, if we are healthy, physically healthy community, and if we are united, I think those would be three great things to describe the city mm-hmm. in ten years. So no, I absolutely agree with that. My first word is going to kind of be out there, I'd say. I want us to be more curious because just as a city, we can also take different examples and uh, learn more from other cities that are also, you know, being accomplished and and pretty much where we want to go, you Mm -hmm. know. So I want us as just as a city and and whole, be more curious, be be ready to grow um, when it comes to that there as well. I love your United. I think I have to definitely agree with that there just because right now we're leaving, we're leading into, I mean, we're, we're, we're social media, we're internet. 
And that's really pulled away from relationships for, yeah. for everyone. And so that's taken away us being united. Everyone fears everyone. I mean, everyone doesn't trust everyone. Mm-hmm. There was a time that you could walk next door and ask for a cup of sugar, you know, that old, yeah, yeah. you know, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? And, and now I just feel like as, as a community, as a whole, as a world in the whole, it's tough to really just go outside and talk to somebody else mm-hmm. that you don't know because you don't trust them or you, you fear them. And then, gosh, lastly, that was a really good question. Mm. Two, is, two is good. Two? So we two is an, good? We have an NFL team in 10 years. Maybe, maybe that's the third that'd be awesome. Yeah, that would be, <laughs> sweet. Yeah, that would be <laughs> sweet. Yeah, that would be sweet. I'll take, I'll take those two. And yeah. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. I would say for me, and I like both of what you guys said, I think for me it, it, it is like United. I want to see us be connected more. Um, have conversations more with people, have a deeper conversation other than just, Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. And then moving on about our day. I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of power in communication and conversation. Um, so more connected, uh, I would say more colorful, not in the sense of skin color or anything like that, but I, I love what's happening now. I'm seeing there's more murals going up. There's more art. And I think of in a place like Sioux Falls where, we have to spend so much time inside. There's a lot of creative people here. We're in, we're cooped up in the house. Our minds are going. We're thinking about things. There's a lot of great people that come from South Dakota. I think that's one of the reasons why is we have so much time to sit and think. Um, so colorful. And then the other one would be, I guess I don't know the exact word for it, but I'd like to see more people volunteering. I'd like to see more people. I, I hate it every year. We, I coach football at uh, O'Gorman Junior High, and we go and we play against teams, and there's just not a lot of coaches. There's not a lot of people that are taking the initiative. Even on, like, the junior football teams, there's issues of getting coaches, and I think that's a big issue because, in my opinion, where are the dads? Like, where are the people that should be coaching their kids at? Mm-hmm. And to see the look on kids' face when they're – at the last game of the season and they don't feel like they've grown at all. It's it, to me, it's not because of them. It's because of the coaching Mm -hmm. and that's an issue because it, it drives people away from productive after school programs, such as sports. You know, I'd rather have a kid being in sports than going home right after school and, and not being supervised type of thing. So um, just more people out there, more people taking the initiative to feed back into our, youth really absolutely for me that was that was a really good question definitely had a stump there we do have to ask though before we get into the five tips that you have for us and wrap everything up when you think of the name overstepping poverty what does that mean to you what comes to mind oh well poverty to me doesn't mean and this may tie in your final question here uh poverty to me isn't just a monetary or financial term and i think a lot of when people hear that they assume it means money yeah you need better wages you need to make more money get out of poverty um overstepping poverty means um getting past some of the barriers that you have relationship wise spiritually physically financially getting past that stepping past that mm-hmm. to be a better version of yourself so i think a lot of times hopefully what we talked about today uh, if I have to give you know some tips to people to overstep poverty, one you got to mm. think of it not just as a poverty's not a financial thing. You got to look at the, your the entirety of your life and saying how am I becoming a better version of myself physically, mentally, as a husband and a, and a spouse, relationally. Do I have three dudes in my life that if it hit the fan I could call mm-hmm. and rely on, or if I was having suicidal ideations do i have a guy in my life i could call or if i don't you have some relationship poverty you need to figure out because Mm. you're very poor with relationships sure uh so to me that's the and i think that's what you guys are trying to do with this is make people look past just the financial uh, side of poverty but how can we become better versions of ourselves Mm -hmm. in a lot of different areas other than just money 100 percent. yes yes sir and i think you just gave us i mean three three tips, tricks, and hacks on how to overstep poverty. I'm just going to ask for just two additional tips, tricks, and hacks for our viewers and listeners on how you would overstep poverty. Well, um, you know, we talked about the relational ones. Uh, I think 
part of it is, um, and if I can get spiritual just for one second here, realizing that this life is very temporary. Um, Mm -hmm. and, And so do not use earthly benchmarks to measure what how God looks at you. God does mm-hmm. not look at your bank account or your LinkedIn profile or your title. Mm-hmm. Uh, God looks at who you are as a man, as a person, as a husband, uh, as a community member. And you may be one of the richest people in this community um, from a relationship standpoint, from the impact you're having. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so easy to say that when you're not struggling with what your next meal is going to be or, you know, how mm-hmm. am I going to pay my mortgage this month? It's People say, well, it's easy for you to say that. Um, but it is very true that, you know, man looks at the outward, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so mm-hmm. I think that's a very important uh, thing to, a hack is to look at who you are as, a, as an entity and how God made you. And probably... You know, the last one, um, I would say, man, that's a great question. So I have four. The last one would probably be um, to hustle, you know, Mm -hmm. and good things uh, don't come to people who sit around and sit in their basins and play Xbox and wonder why they're not having success in life. Mm -hmm. You got to start podcasts. You got to take permission. You got to get out there and work hard and you have to get uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to go sit at a city council meeting. It's uncomfortable to put yourself out there and be vulnerable. It's uncomfortable to be the mayor and uh, get criticized for things. There's a lot of other things I could be doing in my life Mm -hmm. doing this. Um, But it's a good way to grow as a person. So if you want to grow and get past that kind of occupational poverty, if you will, or your status poverty that you're trying to overcome, you're going to have to get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's It's not going to be easy. And you got to get, you got to get, um, okay with being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, we appreciate that. And we appreciate yeah. you being on our podcast. Yeah, guys, Absolutely. I appreciate it. a great conversation less than a year ago to think that we'd be having this conversation with you and helping as many people that we are. I don't know that I would believe it. So I sincerely appreciate you coming on and appreciate you too, Quan. Yes. Appreciate you as well. Well, there you guys have it. The mayor of Sioux Falls. Thank you. Until next time on Over 7 Poverty. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over 7 Poverty. We hope you found this week's discussion informative and thought-provoking. We know that tackling poverty is a complex issue, but by working together and understanding the root causes, we can make progress towards creating a more equitable society. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to our show. Until next time, let's take the next steps in overstepping poverty.